the absolute equality of all men before the law the only true basis of reconstruction an address by william m dixon delivered at oberlin ohio october three eighteen sixty five fellow citizens the long war with its destruction of precious life its fearful waste its harrowing anxieties is now happily over it has not been a failure the object for which it was waged has been completely attained the rebellion is suppressed and the territorial integrity of the union is secure the constitution and laws made in pursuance thereof are everywhere supreme all this too has been accomplished without any degrading or embarrassing compromise the original purpose in this respect of loyal men has been carried out to the letter the rebellion has gained nothing by its violation of law nothing by its appeal from the decision of the ballot-box to the trial by battle its results hold out no premium for a future one and it is a precedent not likely soon to be followed if its strength and prowess were remarkable not less so is its complete discomfiture the position of its chief now and then presents one of the most striking as well as instructive contrasts of history for these auspicious results we are indebted under god to the patriotism intelligence and constancy of the whole loyal people seen in the endurance and bravery of their citizen soldiery in the skill of their military chieftains in their vast loans to their country and in the wisdom of the administration of their government our gratification at these results is the more complete when we remember the dangers we have escaped all this indeed might have been otherwise and there have been hours when the stoutest heart almost failed and the most sanguine began to grow faint-hearted it may be profitable to call some of these occasions to mind when our wayward sisters were abandoning the parental roof that they might be free from its salutary restraints they did not profess to do so in violation of the sacred proprieties of life but claimed that they were acting in strict conformity therewith they would not merely live the lives of an abandon but they would commend their conduct as an example for the guidance of others dropping the figure suggested by general scott's famous letter the rebel states did not place their action upon the ground of the right of revolution but claimed that they were acting in strict conformity with the constitution and that any attempt upon the part of the government to prevent them going would be in violation of that instrument this insidious assumption accomplished a double purpose in the south it removed any scruples of conscience on the part of those who had taken an oath to support the constitution and it made it the duty as in the performance of a constitutional obligation of the minority to take up arms in behalf of the rebel majority against the government which sought by force to preserve the integrity of the nation by this sort of reasoning a large minority throughout the south came to the support of the original seceders and fought as bravely as any in behalf of the rebellion and thus a complete unity was established in almost all the seceding states in the north this insidious assumption was successfully used to divide opinion and to paralyze the government then in the hands of mr buchanan a large party of the north in harmony of principle and feeling with the rebels either declared that the rebel states had a right to secede or maintaining silence on this point furiously denounced as unconstitutional any use of force to preserve the union this latter point was helped out by another and subsidiary assumption namely that there was no constitutional power to make war upon a state and the exercise of the customary power ever since the constitution was framed of compelling obedience on the part of individuals to the laws of the union was denounced as making war upon a state so it came to this that all efforts upon the part of the government to defend its own existence were unconstitutional while all efforts upon the part of the rebels to break it up were legitimate and constitutional thus were the ordinary relations of things changed the rebel states were the legitimists 
and the government itself the outlaw the part became greater than the whole the state than the general government these assumptions had complete mastery of mr buchanan and to so great an extent was the country demoralized by them that able loyal men as a matter of policy had come to the conclusion that the rebel states had better be permitted to go and the union be given up this perhaps was the darkest hour of our cause darker than the days of bull run but fortunately the intelligence and patriotism of the people prevailed they did not stop to analyze this subtle reasoning they knew it was false they knew if any state was permitted to secede it would be but the beginning of an era of anarchy and before the rebel guns had ceased firing upon sumter a nation was springing to arms the union was to be saved secession with all its assumptions was to die and this danger passed away but now my friends shall we transfer the government of our state to the party who even at this day when secession is dead takes up its rotten carcass the resolutions of ninety eight and puts them on their banner the rebels had large expectations of foreign intervention they counted much in this connection upon the aid of their monarch whom they were pleased to designate king cotton this monarch however proved to be of less consequence than they supposed but they were making war in behalf of an aristocratic institution and any dismemberment of the republic would be to the injury of democratic institutions these considerations gave the rebels the ear of the crowned heads and ruling classes of europe this was early by words and deeds manifested there was an indecent haste to recognize the rebels as belligerents which gave them a status and opened the way for the pirate ships and blockade runners but formal recognition was not yet given in the gloomy days of eighteen sixty two when mcclellan had been disastrously driven from before richmond when the second bull run defeat had occurred and the rebels were again before washington and invading maryland there were threatening rumors of foreign intervention france and england were then in consultation on this subject but recognition did not come we have now from what i regard as the highest authority on this point the reason it did not come mr stevens in his letter to semmes written last year says it was prevented by mr lincoln's proclamation of emancipation mr stevens was then vice president of the confederacy and doubtless learned what he said on this point from the rebel emissaries in foreign countries besides the circumstances of the time give probability to this statement while the aristocratic classes in england and other foreign countries were in sympathy with the rebellion the working classes and the liberals of those countries were not and in england these had so much power that the government was bound to respect their opinions but the labors of the eminent liberal leaders were much paralyzed by the fact that our government had steadily refused to emancipate the slaves so that the rebel emissaries could plausibly say as they did that slavery was not involved in the contest that the united states were no more for freedom than the confederacy in those days of our disasters these arguments were being pressed with great effect fortunately for the country mr lincoln came to the relief of our liberal friends abroad the proclamation of emancipation was issued and the danger of foreign intervention passed away much in this relation do we owe to abraham lincoln much very much also to our own first citizen salmon p chase nor should we ever forget the debt of gratitude we are under to those noble and liberal englishmen mill cobden bright and others doubtless they will feel that we have fully paid it if we now reconstruct upon the basis of justice and equal rights and now my friends shall we give over the government of our state to that party which so violently opposed the proclamation and the whole policy of emancipation and who even now would justify what they did in this respect at that time we have already seen that the seceding states were in the main thoroughly united in the prosecution of the war 
and we have seen the cause of this unity they had also counted much upon divisions at the north we have seen that sumter silenced these but the leaders of the party of the north which sympathized with the rebels were only silenced they were not converted for a time they kept quiet but with the early disasters of the war and the general ill fortune attending our cause at that time they became emboldened taking advantage of the discontent of the loyal at the mismanagement of affairs they sought to depress the hopes of the people of final success and to induce them to abandon the cause you have not forgotten how day after day mr vallandigham and his compeers were taunting loyal people with the want of success how they proclaimed endlessly that the south could never be conquered and that war was inevitable and final dissolution in those gloomy days their words were not without effect there are always faint-hearted men who grow weary in any cause and fall out by the way there are also numbers of persons who abandon an administration which they have helped to put in because they do not get the rewards they expected such as these readily attached themselves to the opposition party and it was becoming somewhat formidable in a military point of view the rebellion culminated at gettysburg from that day dates its decadence so in a political point of view it culminated in the same year two years since in the contest of vallandigham for the governorship of this state then was the greatest effort put forth to divide the north in the language of maury an emissary of the rebellion in europe vallandigham was waiting and watching over the border quote, pledged if elected governor of ohio to array it against lincoln and the war end quote. but happily that event never took place and the redoubtable vallandigham was left waiting and watching i will not soon forget that election day in cincinnati it was unlike any other i ever witnessed the day itself was calm and pleasant business had voluntarily ceased the streets had a sabbath-like quietness there was no noise or confusion at the polls the number in attendance was less than usual no military whatever i felt at first that there was to be a small vote and it caused me some apprehension but i was soon undeceived a steady stream of voters poured along they formed themselves into line of their own motion each awaited his turn holding his ballot securely in his hand with steady step and firm countenance such as men put on when engaged in solemn business he approached the ballot box deposited his ballot and passed on in silence and thoughtfulness to his home it was indeed a solemn thing it was a vote for the draft and for taxes many a noble son of ohio who on that day cast his vote for his country has since then given up his life for the same great cause but with that election the hope of dividing the country passed away forever and the capacity of the people for self-government was nobly vindicated my friends mr vallandigham is not now a candidate but his man is the man who voted for him then will you reverse that election this fall in the contemplation of these great dangers and others that might be mentioned through which we have happily passed let us rejoice that the war has not indeed been a failure that the rebellion is suppressed and that the national authority is everywhere re-established but my friends our work is only half done reconstruction remains force produces physical unity this is not the basis of our institutions we may not with safety to ourselves maintain permanently military control of the rebel states proconsular governments are alien to our system yet the rebels have invoked the war power it is not for them to say when or how we shall lay it aside we may not do this until the public safety permits war powers are the defensive armor of a free people to be put on in times of danger but to be laid aside as soon as the danger is past all patriots must desire that the eleven seceding states 
shall as speedily as the public safety will permit become in fact as well as in form members of our common body politic equal in right with the other members and clothed with the powers of self-government how this shall be done is the problem of our politics that now presses for solution in seeking this solution we must carefully consider the character and condition of the people of these states the distinction known in these states between original secessionists and original unionists is thought to be of value in this connection but this has been greatly overestimated indeed many of the original secessionists accept the results of the war more cheerfully than many original unionists in the recent canvass in kentucky as to the constitutional amendment secessionist mcgoffin supported it and unionist garrett davis opposed it nor is this strange it is a part of the constitution of our nature to pass readily from extreme to extreme besides the original unionists do not feel the same degree of guilt and are loath to pay with the secessionists the common penalty of the liberation of their slaves still this distinction may have some value again the distinction between the rich and the poor is put forward as important in this connection the former being looked upon as the authors of the rebellion the latter as their dupes yet this distinction has not much value the poor whites of the south accept with even more reluctance than the rich the emancipation of the slaves the spectre of negro equality haunts them were i compelled to give the colored people into the control of either of these i would prefer the master the fact is and we might as well look at it squarely in the face with a few unimportant exceptions the southern whites yield sullenly and reluctantly to the decision of the sword they are conquered not converted do not mistake me i ask of them no unmanly self-abasement i would not have them otherwise than proud of the prowess they have exhibited in the contest but before i would give them a voice in the affairs of the nation a vote to control your and my concerns i would have a guarantee that this voice and this vote would be directed to the common good that these would not be merely new and more dangerous weapons in their hands to carry on the war against the union is it wrong that i should require this guarantee is it contrary to the laws of human conduct that these mortified and embittered and unconverted men should use their voices in the national councils rather in the direction of their desires and special interests than in behalf of the common good for example many of these men are largely interested in the rebel debt can it be expected that they will vote for the repudiation of this debt and the payment of the national debt incurred in their coercion nay would not their fifty-eight votes in the house of representatives almost one-fourth of the whole number and their twenty-two in the senate nearly one-third of the whole number be a constant quantity for repudiation as mr mill says they would be the only congressmen who could in their own estimation honestly vote for repudiation but it is not necessary that there should be a direct vote to this effect it is enough to vote against taxation and how easily a purpose of this kind could be concealed under the guise of objecting to this or that form of taxation while pretending to be in favor of some sort of taxation and now my friends this is a matter of the gravest concern our free institutions cannot permanently survive so gross a breach of faith as the repudiation of our war debt i would not give these eleven states a vote in the national councils unless i had a guarantee that this vote would not be for this breach of faith again these rebel men have been accustomed all the days of their lives to eat their bread by the sweat of another's face to make this condition of things perpetual they have imbrued their hands in a brother's blood they have failed henceforth they must share the common doom of the sons of adam they must work the slave is free and the immortal proclamation pledges the public faith by the most sacred of obligations to the maintenance of his freedom now may we rationally expect these men to labor faithfully 
to make this pledge good yet the republic cannot permanently survive the breach of this plighted faith i would not give them power in this matter until i had a guarantee that this power would not be used for this breach of faith but what then will you forever exclude these states if not what guarantees do you want upon what conditions would you admit them fortunately these questions can be satisfactorily answered at the commencement of this war it was a common declaration of those who were in sympathy with the rebels that the rebellion could not be put down that history did not furnish an example of eight or ten millions of people determined upon independence being conquered these opinions were generally held by the rulers of europe but there was one important element left out of the calculation namely nearly one half of the population of the rebel states were the determined enemies of the rebellion and this half constituted the laboring class this half neutralized in the long run the other half while i am not one of those who place the bravery of the negro soldiers above that of the white it is a fact which will hardly be denied that but for the opposition of the entire negro population to the rebel cause we could scarcely have succeeded surely had this force been added to the rebel side we could not mr lincoln's proclamation of emancipation derided at the time as a pope's bull against the comet was the death-blow of the rebellion this loyal half still remain they who never in a single instance failed the union cause are now as loyal and faithful as ever we have seen that this half of the southern population neutralized the other half in the war i would have it continue this good work i would so reconstruct the southern states that while i gave to the disloyal half their full equality before the law i would paralyze their disloyal purposes by giving a like equality to the loyal half what wrong is there in this i give to the men who for four years have been laboring to destroy the nation full rights the same which you and i have the only condition imposed is that their loyal fellow-citizens shall have the same rights neither more nor less this solution of the problem of reconstruction is in full harmony with the representative principle and all our institutions it will in a brief time remove proconsular governments and restore the normal condition of all the states the country can then rest satisfied that it has a full guarantee against any efforts of the rebels to do injury under a restored government this solution introduces no new element no new principle into our government it is but the complete application of the principles of our fathers set forth in the declaration of independence the exception which they reluctantly permitted against the negro is removed it gives representation to those whom we subject to drafts and taxes it rests upon the golden rule of right it is but doing unto others what we would that they should do unto us why shall it not be adopted and here the false theory of state rights is again thrust forward by certain parties in the precise same sense and for the same purpose with which it was introduced at the beginning of the war to support the proposition that the government had no right to defend itself against rebellion then the government had no power to resist those who sought its life now these being captured it has no power to require them to give bonds to keep the peace here again the true relation of things is perverted grant indeed not lee has surrendered the union forces not the rebels have been disarmed it is no part of my present purpose to elaborate the argument establishing the power of the government to impose conditions looking to the public safety upon the rebels if it has no power to do this it had no power to make the war the one follows from the other the rebels well knew when they appealed to the tribunal of the sword what the judgment must be if the decision should be adverse to them by the universal laws of war the conquering power may impose such conditions of settlement 
looking to its own safety and welfare as it pleases only these must not be in violation of the laws of humanity this principle clearly gives the government power to adopt the plan of reconstruction proposed surely it is not at variance with the laws of humanity this power also may be derived from the present condition of the rebel states and the peculiar structure of our government but it is unnecessary to elaborate this point happily in their zeal to divide the union party and not because they really approved of it the parties above alluded to the so-called democracy have given an eager assent to president johnson's policy of reconstruction and thereby have stopped themselves from declaring this plan of reconstruction unconstitutional president johnson ignores the state authorities and calls upon a part of the population whom he designates to come forward and reconstruct the state governments this the democracy approve now there is no escaping the proposition that the power which authorizes the president to disregard the constitutions of the rebel states and to confide the work of reconstruction to such part of their inhabitants as he may elect gives him plenary authority in the premises the state constitutions are a complete rule or they are no rule if the president may disregard one provision he may disregard all if he may confide reconstruction to the loyal whites he may also to the loyal blacks i repeat there is no escaping this argument words will not add to its force then by the agreement of all parties there is no constitutional difficulty in the way of this plan of reconstruction what other objection is there but in this connection permit a word in relation to the president's policy while i would have pursued a different one while i would have called upon all the loyal people irrespective of color to come forward and reconstruct their state governments i have no quarrel with the president whatever he may do in the future he is entitled to the lasting gratitude of anti-slavery men for the firmness with which he has insisted upon the abolition of slavery in this respect he has gone further than mr lincoln who proposed to leave the effect of his proclamation to the courts i would have been glad if president johnson had gone further but it would have been an advance step then and perhaps there was wisdom in the policy of giving the rebels opportunity to do of their own motion what they ought to do if they fail the remedy is with congress as an experiment the policy of mr johnson may serve the cause of enfranchisement in the same way that mr lincoln's early policy of not touching slavery served in the long run the cause of emancipation it may the better prepare the minds of the people for enfranchisement but to return what other objection is there to the plan of reconstruction under consideration it is said there is a deeply rooted antagonism between the black and white races forbidding their remaining together in the same country if this is a fact it is a very sad one but it would not furnish an objection specially against the plan of reconstruction under consideration it would seem to apply equally to all plans it is rather the statement of an insurmountable difficulty than the solution of one it is as if one were to complain of the light of the sun or of the alternation of the seasons for this is not a question of introducing four millions of negroes here they are here now and all plans that have ever been suggested for effecting their separation are purely chimerical they cannot be separated and yet the declaration is they cannot remain together the case would seem to be hopeless but happily this declaration is not true the prejudices between these races are not different in character from other prejudices there are prejudices between irishmen and englishmen between catholics and protestants between christians and jews these have often been very violent and wars have grown out of them not however because of their differences but because one race sought to subordinate to itself another or one sect sought to impose its tenets upon another peace prevailed when each race and each sect attended to its own business 
when our fathers framed our constitution they understood these principles and applied them they restrained the different races and sects by securing to each absolute equality before the law they however excepted the negro race it then being in slavery and they seeing no way of securing its freedom permitted this violation of their principles to remain but now we have the opportunity of applying these principles to this race and of thus removing the last exception i would make the application prejudice yields to power and interest the votes of the black men will be too valuable to be slighted it is said however that the blacks could only vote at the point of the bayonet that the southern whites would not otherwise permit them then the rebellion is not subdued we have a truce not lasting peace if this is the case the sooner we know it the better at least it were better to know it before we disband our armies but i do not believe this doubtless the masters are averse to the negroes voting not any more however than they were to their freedom they profess to acquiesce in the latter they will also in the former the rebels are not now in a condition to fight the united states and the freedmen at the polls and in a short time the soldiers of the government can be safely removed every day the negro will acquire knowledge and power all of which will be respected at the polls this thing of fighting is an easy matter to the armed dominant party over his unarmed subordinate but between equals it is a very different affair men count the cost the capacity to do this is attained at a very early age my son said a father the other day in my hearing to his little boy in his first breeches why didn't you strike sam well father replied the urchin wouldn't he have hit me back in those rebel states in which the negroes are more numerous the whites will be slow to provoke a contest they will everywhere rather endeavor in a different way to control the negro votes they will seek them by kindness such is human nature i expect to see the day when a southern democrat will be seen carrying arm in arm to the polls two negro voters for the white race has no monopoly of worthless men they belong to all races again it is objected that the southern negro is ignorant and unfit to vote he seems to have been intelligent enough to be loyal which was more than his master was but i do not deny the ignorance their condition of slavery forbids that it could be otherwise yet they share this ignorance in common with the poor whites and i would be willing to apply to both these classes an educational test still i would not recommend this freedom is the school in which free men are to be taught and the ballot box is a wonderful educator we cannot too constantly keep in our minds that this is not a question as to the policy of introducing into our country four millions of ignorant negroes they are here are to remain with us in the indefinite future we cannot escape if we desired their influence upon our civilization were it possible for them to remain with us and yet to be so excluded from us that they could have no influence upon the common welfare then we might selfishly put them into such imaginary condition and relieve ourselves of all further trouble concerning them but we cannot do this their force must enter as one of the constituent elements in the formation of our american civilization let no one make the mistake of supposing that we escaped their influence when they were in slavery far from it what that influence was jefferson tells us quote, the whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submission on the other our children see this and learn to imitate it for man is an imitative animal the parent storms the child looks on catches the lineaments of wrath puts on the same airs in the circle of smaller slaves gives a loose rein to the worst of passions and thus nursed educated and daily exercised in tyranny 
cannot but be stamped by it with odious peculiarities the man must be a prodigy who can retain his manners and morals undepraved by such circumstances End quote. who would desire a continuation of this influence or of an influence approximating it as the force of the negro must enter into the formation of our civilization it is to the interest of the white man not less than of the black man that this force should be for good it cannot be however unless the negro is moral intelligent and industrious how can we give him these desirable characteristics we have only to consider the conditions under which white men have become moral intelligent and industrious and apply these to the black man our proposition thus becomes very simple we must educate him and place before him the rewards of good conduct and the penalties of bad conduct we must give him entire equality before the law and all these things will follow let not the law be a respecter of persons the humbler the man the greater the necessity that the law should not oppress him the rich and great can take care of themselves with all the opportunities of equal laws the poor man's lot is hard enough he requires the protection of the law and the self-respect which an equality of right before the law engenders in a country where equality is the rule we cannot have an exception founded on caste the ballot is here the evidence of manhood when we deny it to a race we at once degrade that race in the respect of others and what is of greater consequence in its own respect every man the humbler he is the more requires the right of suffrage for his protection and the negro as the most unprotected of all needs it most of all we must educate him and give him the condition of self-respect if we would have his influence for good upon our civilization but while we thus see the necessity of giving to the negro equality before the law even upon the assumption that his presence is a necessary evil let us not forget that this is indeed far from the truth we need his labor in the south and we need the protection of his ballot against the ballot of his former traitorous master and further if we educate him and place him in a position in which he will respect himself we may expect the most gratifying results to the common good in an economic view this is a matter of the greatest moment the increased production of an intelligent self-respecting and industrious population can hardly be estimated in the south thrift will take the place of waste voluntary labor directed by an enlightened self-interest will take the place of compulsory labor directed by the lash provident abstinence will save for a reserved fund that which has heretofore been lost in careless expenditure fixed capital will thus arise towns will spring up the industrial arts will be cultivated and prosperity and wealth will abound where want and poverty have prevailed that rich southern soil with its generous climate is a mine of untold wealth it needs but the hand of free industry to bring it forth all this would greatly contribute to lightening the load of our debt these grateful people would gladly aid in the payment of the ransom for their redemption my friends every consideration which ought to influence human conduct requires that the ballot should be given to the black man the protection of the black man himself requires it gratitude for his devoted loyalty requires it the protection of our civilization from the influence of a degraded and barbarous element requires it the protection of ourselves from the insidious rebel ballot requires it the speedy restoration of the rebel states to their proper relation to the general government requires it the fundamental principles of our government require it the golden rule of our most holy religion commanding us to do unto others as we would that they should do unto us requires it can we withhold it my friends when i leave here should you think of what i have said remember that i have not proposed to take anything from any man no not even from the rebels 
i indeed propose to them their full restoration to all the rights of citizenship as fully as we possess them ourselves i seek nothing which need be offensive to them nothing which is unknown to their own history in their better days before slavery became their absorbing thought free black men voted in many if not all the southern states while we are in the way of restoring the forfeited rights of the rebels let us give to the loyal black man now free his ancient right to vote a gift that costs no one anything but the withholding of which from him makes him poor indeed nay it is for the interest of the south far more than of the north that this should be done there is no safety between absolute slavery and absolute freedom if this plan of reconstruction is adopted a great and happy and prosperous future is open to the south but if the contrary course is taken if the negro is to continue a poor and despised being with no rights which a white man is bound to respect if he is to be the subject of insult and outrage with no other protection than the strength of his arm then indeed the future of the south is very dark the negro will soon know too much know his strength too well to submit our fathers yielding to the embarrassments of the day permitted negro slavery to remain with the expectation it is true that it would soon pass away alas what a fearful mistake this action has been the cause of all our woe shall we repeat this mistake shall we learn no lesson from this sad experience god grant that it may be otherwise let us catch the inspiration of our martyr president at the field of gettysburg let us join in his prayer quote, that this nation under god shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth <laughs>